Good morning and thanks for joining us this Sunday. After a relatively quiet week to honor the nation's 41st president, the last 48 hours have been anything but. The most recent example came yesterday when President Trump confirmed that his chief of staff, John Kelly, would be leaving the White House at year's end. But the biggest news came through court filings Friday from the special counsel and federal prosecutors in New York. The president claims those filings clear him completely. In fact, far from clearing Trump, the documents portray potential legal liability that may be far more significant than many had believed. Robert Mueller's case is beginning to demonstrate a pattern of contacts between Russia and Trump associates, a series of lies about the extent and nature of those contacts, and a possible financial motive. That sprawling tower Trump had long sought in Moscow, what the special counsel called a, quote, lucrative business opportunity that sought and likely required the assistance of the Russian government. And as if the special counsel's probe were not enough, the president faces an entirely separate and growing legal threat. Federal prosecutors working for the Department of Justice now claiming that then-candidate Trump directed illegal hush money to two women during the 2016 campaign, potentially implicating the president in a federal crime, which already has a top Democrat saying it could if true, be grounds for impeachment. And this morning, we'll connect the dots and get to the bottom of where things stand in these investigations. Let's start with our legal panel, ABC News chief legal analyst Dan Abrams, former FBI special agent and Yale Law lecturer Asha Rangapa, and former New Jersey governor, former federal prosecutor, and ABC News contributor Chris Christie. Dan, let me start with you. A lot of different investigations, a lot of strands here. Let's go piece by piece and start with the Southern District of New York and its sentencing memo on Michael Cohen. One of the biggest headlines out of that report relates to campaign finance violations that came out of the so-called hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. They note in the report... Cohen played a central role in two similar schemes to purchase the rights to stories, each from women who have claimed to have had an affair with individual one so as to suppress the stories and thereby prevent them from influencing the election. He acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one, the president being, quote, individual one. So the government appears to directly implicate President Trump in something that's a federal crime. How much of a legal threat does this pose to the president, Dan? Well, look, I, I think this is the biggest legal threat we've seen so far. This is not Mueller's team. This is the federal prosecutors who, in essence, work for Donald Trump in the Southern District of New York, who filed this sentencing memo, which basically says, we think this crime is really serious. We think it was done intentionally to subvert campaign finance laws. We think it was done intentionally to affect the election at the coordination, with coordination from and at the direction of Donald Trump. It is the first time that I've seen something in connection with this investigation where I've said to myself, you know what, I think they might actually seek to indict Donald Trump here. That doesn't mean that they would seek to try him, but maybe just to indict him. Because by implicating him so directly in this way, and in effect by name, these prosecutors are making clear, we think this crime is serious and we think he's involved. And Governor Christie, if you were still a U.S. attorney, would you indict the president? Well, first off, there's Justice Department policy which says that you can't indict a president. So, you know, my guess is that I wouldn't and I'd follow Justice Department policy. Now, I agree with Dan um, that the language in the sentencing memo is different than what we've heard before. We have heard before from Michael Cohen that he did this in coordination with the president. The, the only thing that would concern me if I were the president's team this morning about... Uh, this sentencing memo is the language. The language sounds very definite. And what I'd be concerned about is what corroboration do they have? Because I, everyone knows that Michael Cohen is not going to be the most effective or trustworthy witness on the stand, um, given some of his past statements. The question is, they sounded very definitive. And in my experience, the problem is when prosecutors are that definitive, they've got more usually than just one witness. Now, the flip side for the prosecutors is they better have more than one witness on this, because if you're shooting 
at the President of the United States and the only bullet in your gun is Michael Cohen, well, then I think that's a problem. So I think it'd be very interesting to see how this plays out. But I, I note the same thing that Dan did. Um, I've always said, Martha, on this air, that I thought that the Michael Cohen situation was much more perilous for the White House than was Bob Mueller. There's no Russian collusion. There's been no proof of Russian collusion. Um, and I don't think there's going to be. It doesn't appear to me there will be. Um, this is the, the stuff that's much more, should be much more concerning to the White House legal team. And that language is very, very strong and very definitive. So the prosecutors better have corroboration. Because if they don't, they just go with Michael Cohen, that's a problem. But if they do have corroboration, that could be a problem for the White House. And, and Asha, do you agree with that? Felony prosecutions in campaign finance are not all that common. So what do you think New York prosecutors do now? That's right. Um, I, I do agree with the governor that the prosecutors would need to show that the president uh, acted knowingly and willfully in order for it to become a criminal violation. That's when it crosses from a civil to a criminal penalty. And here, with regard to the witnesses, re let's remember that the Trump Organization CEO, Alan Weisberg, um, has been talking to prosecutors. And, you know, unlike, I, I know Rudy Giuliani has compared this to the John Edwards case, which was not successful, but there are many differences here. And one of those is that there are witnesses who are available who can corroborate things like the uh, reimbursement made to Michael Cohen, the purpose that those were done, why those were concealed, for example. Um, and you have a, a tighter or you have a, a more direct timing issue here in the sense that these payments were made almost right before the election and 10 years after the affair actually took place, which tends to substantiate that this was done for the purpose of affecting the election. So I, I believe that the prosecutors here would have a strong case if they wanted to pursue and, it. And Martha, I think that we all take for granted too much this idea that they definitely can't indict a sitting president. There is a difference between an indictment and a tr criminal trial. And if you actually read the most recent assessment from the Office of Legal Counsel, they really seem to be saying you can't indict and prosecute a sitting president. Yes, they talk about the idea of, of an indictment, but I don't think that that's completely off the table, particularly when you read this document. Governor I Christie, I want, yeah, I want you to jump yeah, in there. I, I disagree with Dan on that in this respect. I mean, what's your end here? If, if I were a U.S. attorney in making this judgment, and they say, well, you can indict the president, Chris, but you can't try him. I mean, now you do that if someone's outside your jurisdiction in a foreign country, et cetera, but it, and you have no other way to go. Statute of limitations problem. No, we have here. The potential of five year statute of limitations, if the president were to then continue for a second term, it would expire. Well, here's the, here's the issue, though. You have an alternative venue, and the alternative venue is the House of Representatives. Um, if, if the House of Representatives believes this is a high crime or misdemeanor, as defined by the Constitution, the House of Representatives can bring articles of impeachment, which are the equivalent of an indictment. And I think I'd argue that that's a much more appropriate way to do this than to have some prosecutor, some AUSA yeah. in the Southern District of New York do this with the President of the United States. One other thing I want to point out about um, willfulness and intent. You know, I, I think what you'll hear the President argue is that he, this is the first time that these women at this juncture threatened to go public about these alleged affairs and that he wanted to be kept quiet to avoid the embarrassment for himself and for his family. And there, there is no evidence at this point that we know of that they had threatened to go public any time before. But they before. had gone public before. I mean, Stormy Daniels actually told her story to two different magazines and a blog, um, and she took a polygraph for them. So this has been out there as far back as 2011. So I think that that argument, I agree with the governor that that's the argument that will be made, but I think that it will be a very hard one to make. And I think it'll also be hard for the president to argue that he was trying to somehow protect his family and business when he has made it a part of his uh, brand, really, to be a, you know, a womanizer who has wow. affairs and, and leads, <laughs> you know, previous wives very publicly. It doesn't seem like this is something that he um, otherwise has ever tried to keep secret. I I'm, hardly I'm think that's part of the here. brand. Uh, I hardly think that's part of the brand. And I don't think that's what you hear the president or anyone around him argue. In the end, 
Um, you know, the, the willfulness and intent portion of this will be the hardest thing to prove, and that's why, Martha, as you rightly said, you don't see a lot of felony prosecutions brought on campaign finance violations because that's a pretty high hurdle for prosecutors. But, but according I, I, to these I prosecutors, on, Dan, they have yeah. to. Let me move yeah. on to the Russia investigation. We really have to get that, to that, too. There's so much to turn to. The Russian investigation, then the question of collusion. We've been talking about collusion for many, many, many months. We now have from Robert Mueller evidence of a series of contacts between individuals in Trump's orbit and Russians dating back to the early days of the campaign. But those are contacts, not collusion. What more would the special counsel have to show to have collusion, Dan? Well, you, you still need a crime here, right? I mean, you're allowed to have conversations uh, with Russians. It, it, there's no crime against having conversations with Russians. Uh, there's no crime against having conversations with Russians about building a huge tower with Donald Trump's name on it. Uh, the question becomes, why did the Trump team want to push back the date from June of the conversations about the Trump Tower back to January. What additional contacts were happening between January and June? And when you read the sentencing memo, this one from Mueller specifically says that he's providing information that goes to the core of the Russia investigation. The core of the Russia investigation. So that means we're not just talking about conversations with Russians. Again, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to find that there was a crime here, but I would be very nervous if you're in the Trump orbit with that kind of language coming out in the sentencing memo. I, I would be less so, Martha, for this, for this reason. You saw how definitive the Southern District of New York was, and it's stark that Mueller was not nearly that definitive. Now, that could mean one of two things. He's not ready to be definitive yet. Um, he doesn't have enough evidence, but this has been going on now for 18 months. And so, and he's had cooperation from Manafort and from Cohen for some period of time. Now, he may be making a strategic decision not to lay that card out right now, but I, I would, if, if I were the Trump legal team, I would be spending my time focused on the things that are talked about in the Cohen sentencing memorandum and not the Mueller sentencing memorandum, because it's not nearly as specific and not nearly as definitive as what you saw in the Southern District. Well, this is why it's very uh, difficult when people lie to you and you're a prosecutor. It delays the investigation. So the fact that Manafort was quote unquote cooperating doesn't really help here. He was lying to them the whole time. But I, I want to just disagree here with my colleagues in that I don't know that there has to be a crime. This is a counterintelligence investigation, which means that collusion can involve agreeing to, I mean, it would essentially be still conspiracy to defraud the United States, well, yeah. but, you know, trying to help your foreign adversary um, execute a, an intelligence operation against the United States is problematic from a constitutional the, point of view. But where's the that, evidence of that? Well, I mean, there's no evidence because Mueller's, of that. Because these, these sentencing memos show that there were contacts with Russia going back to 2015. That means that with the uh, overtures to make a meeting with President Trump, then candidate Trump and Putin, um, that expands this timeline, which means that there was a self-interested motive, whether it was for the Trump Tower uh, or for the Moscow Tower. But weather makes a difference. Yes, I mean, course course depending does. on which one is either crime versus not crime. Well, that's right. And this but is, this is where... Christy, Governor Christie, let me ask you this. If yeah. Manafort's conversations with the administration were all legal, why would he lie about them? Is that suggestive of a cover-up no, there? Well, because Paul Manafort is a consistent liar, and he has been, and it's been proven now, not only by Bob Mueller, but by a lot of the public statements that he's made over the time that he was involved with the campaign. So the fact that Paul Manafort is lying in an attempt to spare himself spending the rest of his life in prison is no great shock. And I will tell you, as, as a former U.S. attorney, the kind of conversation we just had is why you have a U.S. attorney. Agents, FBI agents, do an amazing job. They work incredibly hard, and they get incredibly invested in their cases. And the job of the U.S. attorney, or in this case, Special Counsel Mueller, is going to be to say, okay, I understand what you hope, what you think, what might be. What can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt? And on Russian collusion, we have not seen anything well, we other than... There were contacts, and as Dan said earlier, if those contacts are about building an office building in Moscow and giving the penthouse to Vladimir Putin, people may not like that, but it's not a crime. But we haven't seen is the key phrase here, because there's a lot redacted in this. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing has big, big black marks over sentences, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is because Robert Mueller isn't ready to disclose what he has. It doesn't mean that he doesn't 
have it. It means that he's not ready to discuss it yet publicly, and I think that's a critical factor. Well, and again, uh, Governor I'd Christie, that, I want to ask you, know. you just one, one quick question for you to close on, and that is the president tweeting that he's totally clear. You disagree with that, I suspect? My view would be that you're not totally cleared, nor is anyone, until Bob Mueller shuts down his office and hands in the keys. Um, a special counsels can go on for a very long time. This one has. I mean, for goodness sakes, the, the, the guy the president just appointed, uh, nominated to be U, uh, United States Attorney General, um, appointed a special counsel during 1992 in the middle of the Bush re-election campaign that went on for three more years and found no crimes committed by the Bush administration. So these things have a life of their own, Martha. And I would say to everybody what I said to the president right from the beginning. There's a lot, no way you can make this shorter, but there's lots of ways you can make it longer. And one of the ways to do that is to say you're in the clear when um, the prosecutor still has subpoena authority, authority to indict people, and the ability to be able to keep this investigation going. Until Bob Mueller shuts down and hands the keys and his credentials back in, um, no one's in the clear. And let's be clear. Okay. There's, nothing to, there's nothing to support that. I mean, yeah, there's nothing to support that. He's directly implicated. <laughs> All right, and on that note, we'll end it. Thanks, Governor Christie. Thanks, Asha, and thanks, Dan.